All right. Oh, that's better. Can you hear me? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Kev kind of ended out that I had been working on in the sense that I was writing this. I have not. Um, that's taken way too much credit for this. Um, oh yeah, so my name's Tom. I'm here tonight to, oh, let's put this in presentation mode. What did they, why would they take that out of a version, the presentation mode thing? <laughs> ah, screw it, we'll leave it anyway. Uh, so my name's Tom. I'm doing a talk tonight on Aurelia. Aurelia is a client-side JavaScript framework. Um, I've been working with it for about like eight, ten weeks now um, in a work project, um, doing a bit around home as well. Um, and I've had a really good experience with it. Um, and I had a, uh, what was it, last month when we were talking about Vue.js, maybe the, the month before, um, there was a quick little survey and it seemed I was probably the only one who was actually aware of what it is. Does anyone know of what it is? Anyone heard of it before? Yeah, cool. That's, that's really actually awesome. That's because I work with you and I tell you about it all the time. Um, so, okay, so what I really wanted to get through tonight was um, just going overview about it, but I'm a software developer at a startup in Brisbane here called Red Eye. Uh, we do engineering, drawing management, and asset management sort of stuff. Um, I mostly work in PHP and then do a lot of JavaScript as well with that too. I'm on Twitter and I have a side project called Piggybike. If you use Strava and you ride to work, you can use Piggybike to track how much money you ride. And I know there's at least three people in here who also use this app, which is awesome. Um, if you, if that sort of makes sense to you, then you might be interested in that. And yes, you can get dot bike domains now, which is awesome. So tonight, I just wanted to go over quickly what is Aurelia, um, and that just includes sort of like what it is, where it's been, and where it's going, and then actually do some live coding, which is horrifying. But um, we fingers crossed it'll work the way we expect it to. So Aurelia, as I said, it's a client side framework, um, but they're really big on just forward thinking. So the big thing about that is just thinking about. Uh, future standards and trying to take as many of them as possible we can now um, and polyfilling our way to, the, to sort of safety and sanity. Um, and part of that comes out things like these in ES7 where they can largely just from decorators um, and then ES6 everywhere. Uh, using things like the W3C HTML templating spec um, pretty like pretty heavily and these sort of things go the whole way through. Um, the idea is you're supposed to be writing code that's light in the sense of the framework so you feel like you're just writing normal JavaScript code and everything kind of works together um, and that's largely because they're big on convention over configuration so not too much sort of like wiring everything together you just kind of write some code and everything sort of seems to work which is awesome so as i said they're really big on just making it easy for you it's focused on the developer experience so they want it nice for you so i found it really good um it's been really really productive for me you can knock out pretty much anything i need uh, pretty easily right now um, and solve most of my problems i think i spent um about like 20 minutes watching a video from Aurelia and was just getting an idea of it before I chose whether I wanted to go with it. So I thought it was all right, so I um, spent about sort of two hours actually playing around with some demo stuff they gave and felt pretty happy with it. Spent two days, two days I was like, yeah, this is sort of the way to go. And after about two months, I'm pretty sold on it by now. Um, it's based around like view, view model, which add a model, 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 yeah, it's, it's all the same. Um, if you've ever worked in Windows Phone Framework or Silverlight or uh, Durandal, which is another framework built on, on top of Knockout, then this will feel very familiar, and that's largely because of who made it. So the creator of this is a guy called Rob Eisenberg. He's a really, really smart, talented person. Um, he's written lots of UI frameworks um, that sit on top of like .NET um, and Windows Phone Framework and all sort of stuff. So I actually, in our work project, I got one of our Android developers who'd spent a lot of time also writing some Windows Phone stuff, and he immediately picked this up and goes, this feels a whole like Windows Phone framework. And even the iOS devs said, actually, all the things we see in this feel really similar to what we're dealing with. So it was a really nice sort of like um, bridging a gap between, I guess, web and native um, for those developers who are jumping a lot easier than they'd had experiences writing the likes of Angular um, 1 back in the day. So um, the big thing about these guys is Aurelia is, sorry, Aurelia has behind it a company called Durandal. So Durandal was a, originally a JavaScript framework built on top of Knockout. Um, built by Rob Eisenberg. So Rob Eisenberg built Durandal, was all happy, he was doing some other things, and then was working towards like a sort of a V2 for Durandal. Um, again, uh, I think still in Knockout, but I might be wrong. Um, and he was painting this picture of where he wanted to go with it, and uh, the Green Tea team, so that team behind Angular, saw this, and they were like, hey, this is sort of like where we want to go. We think it's really cool, we want you to come work on Angular 2 with us. 
So he spent um, some time there, I think it was a couple of months, and it was just after a while they started to realize that they were sort of going in different directions. Um, he was finding they were going down the same rabbit holes and the problems they're facing in Angular 1, um, and it wasn't really aligning with where he wanted to go with a UI framework for web. Um, and that's basically how like Aurelia came about. So set up Durandal Inc, which is a Delaware C Corp, so it's actual whole company. Um, and their idea is, you probably have been familiar with this with other like open source companies, you could say as well. They build an open source software and then they sell consulting and support, all this sort of stuff with it. Um, but what's really big then is Aurelia is the product, developers are the customers, so that's you and I. And they're really big on supporting us as developers to get everything we need out of it. Um, it also means you can get uh, consultants for hire from them as well. Um, there's already the case that people are hiring Durandal um, consultants for building stuff, which is great. So they have about 10 to 20 um, devs as part of their team. Um, I think, as far as I can tell, they're all still employed in some other regard, but they work on the core product. Um, this is good though, because they're actually building real things for their other day jobs and are contributing to the main framework based around their use cases and what they've seen. Um, so there's, there's really good discussion about like where they're going as a, as a business from like that sort of structure and it's, it seems like a pretty good picture. Um, to differ, just so you understand, like something like Angular, not to crack shit on Angular here tonight, but the idea behind Angular is it actually comes from a team within Google um, and being an open source product, it's like we've built this and it's, everyone can use it, but it's not technically like a product that they support actively. Um, it's actually built for an internal CRM um, and then it kind of has become a bit bigger and you consider there's also like about five other competing internal Google frameworks, um, Dart and Polymer off the top of my head sort of thing. So um, it was sort of, or really was introduced to the web in um, January. He'd been working on it for a little longer than that though. And it hit beta last year in November. Um, and then V1 is supposed to officially come out in the next couple months. It's a bit sort of vague as to where it's going. So they've been in beta for a while now. It's been pretty stable. They're not really big on making any breaking changes. Um, it's supposed to be another beta, uh, yeah, like a beta V2, which is just performance upgrades coming out soon, I think. Um, so where I really found this was really convenient for starting, um, I had started this, it was back in probably like early April, and it was between uh, Angular 2 beta versions, and I was like, building a new project, I'd sort of wait up, and we couldn't, we didn't really have enough sort of resourcing to go down the avenue of trying out React. A lot of us had only really done something like Angular at our workplace. Um, and I knew React would be a really good choice, but I didn't know much about myself, and if I needed help from others, there wasn't really anyone um, there who could really help me with it. So I tried going down to Angular 2 React, because I'm like, I've had some issues with Angular 1 as a project got too big, I wanted to see what Angular 2 is like, and I could not for the life of me get a project set up. It was in a state, a weird state between um, two betas, where they don't actually produce really a skeleton application, you could say, like a, a boilerplate, or at least at the time, um, and I couldn't get everything set up the way I needed it to actually even try it out before I evaluated whether I wanted it. Um, this is where it's a bit different for Aurelia, so they have a what's called a skeleton navigation app. Um, so I'll quickly just show you here. So it's a GitHub repo that comes with like six different flavors. Let's try and blow that up. Um, so they come with ES 2016, ES 7, in either Gulf or Webpack flavors, TypeScript in either Webpack or Gulf flavors, and some TypeScript and ASP.NET. Um, a quick caveat, if you're a .NET developer, um, there seems to be a strong connection here, and I'm not entirely sure what, but apparently .NET developers really like Aurelia, and they must see something really good about it, or they just really like Rob Eisenberg for some reason. But there's some really good stuff, and it's been picked up a lot by some .NET circles, um, so there must be something really good about it. Don't ask me, I'm not a .NET developer. Um, so we ended up going down the channel of choosing ES7 and Gulp, and largely speaking, it's been really good. What's particularly good about this is, as issues naturally occur with things like JSPM, and I won't go too much into them because Ash will be talking about it later, and he can explain all the problems with JSPM. Um, whenever there's problems like this, there's like sort of a couple hundred other people out there who are also using basically the skeleton navigation as their base application, and then they're also going through the same issues. Um, any sort of issues which are based around how the skeleton's put together are all addressed there, and this is officially like supported by the core team, so when there's a new change that affects something, that would affect your base that you would really start with. They're supporting it, so when a new beta comes out, they're the ones that make sure that their scale navigation works, which again differs a bit to, um, uh, to Angular. So this is a bit, I guess, really scary because they start live coding. Um, so. Is that readable at all? Yeah. Okay, cool. 
Uh, if you have any questions, just like raise your hand because I can all see you right here, so it's it's good. Um, so I've checked out just the the ES7 um, gulp skeleton. So it's got a whole bunch of basically boilerplate code that you need here. Um, I'm not sure if you can particularly see this, but there's some gulp tasks, um, uh, the SRC directory where all our stuff lives, style of course, and a couple of interesting things um, like the index HTML, very light. It loads system.js in the config file, um, and then the index.js for it is actually for Electron, so the Skeleton app actually supports Electron as well, which is the ability to need that too. Ooh. 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 Yeah, they have a, um, a Electron sort of Skeleton for it, which is cool. Um, but the actual code for the index HTML, it's really, really light. Um, the main stuff that actually happens is everything in your SRC directory. Um, so uh, it's pretty simple. You need to npm install, get all your stuff you need locally, um, and then jspm install. Again, I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's a package manager for sort of, I guess, front end sort of client assets and stuff. Um, it's okay. It's been the main cause of all our grief so far has just been jspm, um, and they're aware of this. And unfortunately, like most things in JavaScript, they're planning on building their own alternative to JavaScript package manager. So <laughs> we look forward to that because that'll also give us heartache. Um, so all this is telling is a really app, you might have, if you've written Angular, you'll see this before, it's like uh, ng-app I think as well. Um, it's saying let's load the main JS file, and again I'm going to block all of these. So this is where they come to, it's a uh, convention over configuration, it's pretty straightforward. The bootstrapping stuff is not really that exciting, I'd really not even like to talk about it because there's not really anything going on there. It's saying just use the default out of box settings. Um, and what this does is it starts automatically looking at app. Um, this configures a router, and what I'll do, let's split this. So this is configuring our app, it configures a router. So Aurelia is built on a set of components. If you don't like the router, you can rip it out and put, put in your own. If you don't like, I don't know, uh, loggers, event aggregators, however you want to, whatever sort of component of the system, you can pull it out, replace it with that, what, whatever you want, it's really easy. Um, but again, the app HTML is not too exciting either. Um, what you might notice straight up is the JavaScript is uh, ES6 classes. Um, it's really nice if you're jumping between languages, and especially if you write, I don't know, I write PHP, it feels really similar, so I can jump in and out of languages like pretty easily. Um, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, the HTML is all the W3C HTML templating spec or something like that. Um, that's what they're wrapped in template tags and sort of thing. And this is where they come to, we're thinking future, what are future specs, what can we take on now and just get it into our, our system and go from there. And that's where also you'll see uh, requires, and this is just importing some other like other resources into our app. Um, so example, this is loading the nav bar, which is a heck like a template partial and just rendering straight in there. Uh, I won't go too much into that, because um, I'd just like to get into and talk about what the difference is we'll, how they sort of wire up views and view models, um, and how you start finding data, which is essentially the nuts and bolts of what you're going to be doing in most applications anyway. Uh, oh, of course. Right. So, so this is on the left. This JavaScript is the view model, and on the right it's the view. Um, it's really simple. There's not really anything specific to the framework at all to do this. It just kind of works. So on the right in the view, we've got the template tags again, HTML5 spec, section is just some nonsense for Bootstrap to make it look pretty, and H1 is a heading. And this is how we start to bind data. So just to spit out some data from the view model, this, if you're familiar with HTML, uh, with um, JavaScript uh, string templating syntax, I think it's called, um, it looks a lot like this. They chose this then for their templating framework because they're like, hey, it's the same as JavaScript, that's gonna be easy for you to write. And it is, it works really well. Um, so there's a couple of different places we can go with this. Um, uh, we can start talking about different bindings. So say we wanted to modify this heading, we import, or we just use it text field, and we use value.bind. Uh, again, is this readable? People see this? Cool. So, should have shown you this is actually what it looks like. 
So this is our heading and this input field, as soon as we start typing, it changes there. So we talk a lot about in binding uh, one way, two way, one time, and there's I think another one which I can't remember off the top of my head. The text in here in the heading is one way bound because it's text and you can't change it. The text in the input field is by default two way bound, but you can change that yourself as well. So dot bind on an input field will automatically know, hey, this is a like input field, it's gonna be two way binding. You can overwrite that and change that to one way binding as well. Um, this is gonna be a really exciting form that does really nothing at all. Uh, we might show you something else. So you can manually specify it as two way, but it's not really anything else. So this is the one way one. So if I, as I change that, nothing changes. But when I change the two way binding, it changes like the internal, um, the, the internal value for it, which binds down into the other one as well. If you wanted to avoid that, there's also one time binding. Um, so as I change this and I change this, this never actually updates because it's only bound the first time. So it's basically when the template's rendered. Um, so this is, I found it really good because it's quite explicit in how it works. <coughs> There's not sort of any magic as to how the binding works and it's basically everything else apart from te text area, input, select, etc., etc., is all one way bound. It's logical, what you expect. Um, so we can start with something else, just say we want to do like a shopping list or something like that. Um, to-do list MVP, great idea. Um, so we can add a, a method to let's add item and we'll just give it a default value some something. So it's just sweet UI, sweet. All right, so input text field, we're gonna value bind the item text. So it's not gonna be very exciting. It'll do exactly what we just did before. So this is just loading in the background. Gulp, gulp was reloading the page. Nothing really exciting. Um, you did have to do nothing to get that gulp working. It's just out of the box configuration from that skeleton. It's nice. Things are changing, this is good. So we're going to create a button. And the way we get to do stuff, so add item. The way we do something on click is click.delegate add item and all this does is when you click on it it triggers the add item function from your view model it's really really simple so let's get an array then i guess we've got all our items for our shopping list and we empty to start with and we're going to go this items push this item and we'll also want to clear out the text field as well once we're done so this item equals Oop, blank, and that's pretty simple. So this isn't really going to do anything because we haven't actually rendered our list anywhere, but hey, things are starting, which is good. So we can render out the length of our items array. This is just JavaScript underneath, so we can do items.length, happy days, there's zero items in there. Now we have one, now we have two. Cool. So the next thing you usually get to when you're looking at like a, a how you bind stuff is to do repeaters. Um, so like ng repeat, you do something a little bit different here. So it's a ul, and on the element repeating, it's repeat four, and you go item of items. So now you have locally scoped um, this variable called item. So we'll render this out. Now, if you're familiar with, um, I think it's in ES6, the four of loop in JavaScript, it looks a bit like this. So if you want to iterate through all the items without getting the key, so you actually just get the value instead, it looks like this, which is exactly why the templating syntax for repeating for something looks like a repeat for and then item of items, because it feels like JavaScript, because it is just JavaScript. So this is a nice little similarity between what you're writing in JavaScript and then what comes out in HTML. Um, just make it a little bit easier for you. So now we'll see something announced in our list, which is, hey, it's really cool. Um, so what we can do um, is, let's say we wanted to make our shopping list loud. Um, that doesn't make any sense. When I was thinking about writing this, I had no idea what, could I, what I could do to show up some of the different things in the framework. So let's just make a shopping list loud for now. Don't ask why. So we're gonna create something called a value converter. So this is how, when you go to render something, you can pipe it through some like a filter or something like that, modify it before it gets actually rendered. Um, you can put this file anywhere, but I like to have a directory called value converters because they tend to be used a lot. 
Uh, and I'm going to just call it lab.js. And what we're going to do is we're going to want something that we can go item and then pipe it into loud, which is a value converter before it goes out to render. And there's a couple like convenient things that we get from naming things in a certain way. So we're going to, oh, I'm going to here. Not too far. So we're going to write a loud value converter. And when we have the value converter part in the class name, it auto wires some stuff in Aurelia for you to plug it up into here once we've imported it. So what we need to do is actually include this class into, uh, or include this file into the template. So we use that templating spec require from value converters that usually auto suggests and confuse why not. Uh, loud JS, and now I've included that loud value converter because it's got the class name that ends in value converter. It's wired up some things for you, but what it's going to look for is a method named to you. And the first argument for this is always going to be what you pass into it. So it's going to be a string for us, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we're going to return string dot to uppercase and add an exclamation mark to it. So now. Really? Yeah, I think it was yes. In the folder name. Yes, correct. Thank you. Now I'll be watching that loading. Yeah, it was yes, but I'm back again. What, I tried to save. <laughs> All right, there we go. This is the problem with live code. All right, so I'm going to add something. And now we've made it loud. Congratulations, guys. We've changed the world. We have loud shopping lists now. So. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. All right, so this is exactly what we expect. Oh, empty. Um, so this is really good because you can do some really cool stuff with this. Just um, templating, uh, sorry, formatting of dates as they go out. So you can actually pass just the date object into it. Into there you can format it because you can start to add um, a second <coughs> argument to this. Um, this is why I shouldn't have done this too, I think. And we can get this out as a second argument uh, suffix, let's say. Fingers crossed this works. And it's last words. Cool. So you can actually start binding other things into it. So a common use case we've used it for is, yeah, as I said, date formatting. So we can say, like, here's the format for moment, which takes forever to load. That's right. Um, pass something like that in so we can format a string. Um, but they don't just end their value converters because they're basically anywhere where you've rendered a, or used the, what do you say, bound a variable. Um, you can actually plug them into somewhere here. So. Um, Let's write another value converter, which is sorts. Uh, really, really simple. So it's called sort.js. Uh, ooh, wrong one. So again, export class sort value converter. Uh, yeah. So we're going to pass in an array this time. Name whatever you want, don't care. Return array sort. So this is an array of strings so that will sort it alphabetically, happy days. Um, we now need to register this value converter. Done. And pipe sort. So it's going to pipe the items array through sort before it actually handles it in the iterator. Um, so now when we add something and then apple, it's now sorted it. So you can do stuff as well if you want to do client-side filtering um, for whatever reason. Um, you can do stuff just using a value converter. It's really easy to wire up here and things like that. Um, if you then want to start pushing this out into like a custom element, which is what really pushes you into heaps, is building components for everything and building your application as a series of components which back together. Um, uh, all you're going to do is let's just have the list element. So uh, uh, list item list component JS. So you can chuck this anywhere. Uh, I usually put it in another folder, but we won't for now. Um, and this is where I guess the first starts, the first sort of parts of um, the framework start to come out. So we're going to need to import uh, binding. So if you're not familiar with this, this is all ES6, I want to say. Um, uh, syntax for importing modules and sort of stuff. Ash might go into this more later. We hope so. And um, it's, it's pretty familiar after a while. Um, so actually what we want is something called bindable. 
So with bindable, we can say we want to have an element, or sorry, a, a variable, I guess you could say, called items, which you can bind them to this component. And this, this is actually going to do nothing. Um, this component's a bit of a waste of time, uh, really. But uh, with this component, we also have a view that comes along with it. And if you've sort of picked up, um, things like the view model um, of this list, um, it renders a template called list.html. It's just defaults. It works out of the box. You can override it really easily with one static method. You rarely have to. Um, uh, I should actually explain there's a router here, but it would have been good to explain, which configured a list module, it appears in the nav bar, it renders out, and it looks for a module ID, which is, I don't know why they call it module ID, I would have just called it like file name or something, I don't know. It looks for a list class, or sorry, a list.js in this directory. Um, it works pretty well. So there's a lot of stuff like this that just sort of looks in the right place for it. Um, that's the whole point of the convention of the configuration, I guess. Um, and it works pretty well. So this list component, we need to start everything with with that templating, and then um, we can just do a UL, and then actually let's just go and copy our code, it's way faster. Then we're gonna need that um, value converter we had as well for sort. And it's all the same rotation. So now in our base in our base view model, then we now need to use this component instead of just rendering it out ourselves. We require we require our what do we call it list component component. Yeah, that's right. So because we have oh come on oh re oh. there we go. Um, because we said that there's a boundable uh, sort of attribute for items, we go, oh, now it's not big enough. We go list component, which we've imported above, and it knows, I think I spelled that right. And we can go items.bind, and then items. So this is really simple. Um, this is then by default one way bound. You can overwrite this by setting a default, um, uh, default binding in here. The easiest way is just to say this is one way bound or this is two way bound. But it's all one way bound by default. Um, Why is that different on the list compared to the edit box? Okay, so on the list, this is passing it from the view down into the component. So what the component knows about that item is what, how often that changes or if that's going to change. Um, no, it's more just the, the the option where you go dot bind. Yep, so dot bind is by default one way except for select text area and inputs. Convention. Oh, you know, no configuration. Just there. you could have remembered that stuff. Yeah, it's it's you don't really notice it too much because they're the only things that ever have that. Um, you can change it, as I said, you can keep that as just items to find. And if you're creating something that's like, I don't know, like a public component that you're sharing on GitHub or something like that, you'd probably do something like this, and then you'd specify in here its default binding. Yeah. Okay. Um, binding mode, and that points to uh, the binding mode you got to insert, which is just two way or one way, something like that. Right. Um, that's I think the more official way if you're like publishing components and something like that. Um, so this now looks exactly the same, we hope, which is a massive success really for live programming, that we did something and nothing changed. <laughs> um, Didn't that, that's, really, that's really the great thing. Um, so it's probably the only other thing I want to say is when you start working obviously in something a bit bigger than just creating a to-do list that has no storage on here, you start dealing with services. Um, so you have just service classes which do something. So let's just say um, uh, storage JS. This is if I had the motivation or the I guess the balls to try and do local storage in this demo, then I would. But um, we can have a save function here, which takes in a list and does something, um, and then we can call it fine. If we need, now need to inject this service into our uh, into our view model back in list.js. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. So the sort of safe way is to do a static inject method, which looks for, so of course you'll have to import the storage class, storage from storage. Um, the static, uh, static inject method is to do something like this, where you return an array of the object itself. Um, personally, I prefer to use uh, annotations which come out from 
at the moment that still transpile because nothing supports it, but um, uh, it works pretty well. So there's a inject uh, annotation from the earlier framework, which we'll just import. And we do something that looks a bit like this. So inject, and we're gonna inject storage. And then in our constructor, we get a storage instance through its dependency injection. This dependency injection is actually just a standalone component. Um, you can use it on Node. I think some people actually do. Um, I don't know what it's like, don't ask me, but it works pretty well for this. Um, so now we have this storage accessible. So we might have like a save button later, which would trigger a save event. And ooh, you'd do uh, this storage save. So this inject stuff is about the closest you start getting to like writing framework code um, specifically. There's no reason that you couldn't use any other dependency injection though, because it's just about how you build classes um, and result dependencies, of course. Um, and then the one other thing to talk about, which I found really, uh, I found really good coming from uh, another background in sort of like writing Angular before, and what a lot of the Windows Phone developers found uh, really sort of familiar with as well was lifecycle events. So for a view model like this, for view, view model like this, there's a couple things that go on. There is a like two ones I'd like to talk about is there's an activate um, method, which is like it's resolved the routing and it's trying to load the view model. Um, it calls a activate method on your view model first. And if you return a promise in this bit, you can actually prevent the router from going down until the promise is resolved. It's really convenient because you can do API calls and that return a promise for that so that nothing renders until your promise is resolved, which is excellent. And the other one, which is attached. So attached is after it's been inserted into the uh, HTML slot or whatever like that. So that's actually when things are living inside the browser um, for a really good reason. So quickly we'll just in this activate, if we return a new promise. So uh, uh, Aurelia had a dependency a little while ago on system J, uh, system JS, yeah, um, for a whole bunch of polyfills, which they've ripped um, system JS. Anyway, and they've ripped a whole bunch of them out and put them into their own component for Aurelia polyfills. So it's pretty like dependency light now. Um, it's all sort of self-contained, which is really good. Um, it doesn't really change much for us as developers though. Might be you, but maybe not for me. So we're just gonna set a timeout in here. Um, and we're not gonna resolve this for like a second. Uh, and you'll quickly see that this, you probably won't see because it takes a while anyway. Um, this waits for a second before it actually, um, yeah, before it um, it actually loads the thing. So it, it sort of rep, uh, resembles what we're doing if it was doing an API call. But attached is really cool because you now know that it's living in the DOM. And what this is really good for is something like, uh, but really it's still really big on pushing it into writing stuff which uh, uses like native DOM events, um, especially propagating through components all the way up through a chain, um, wherever you can. So they give you a really nice way of, uh, of getting an actual element into the view model quite easily. So they just give you ref and then let's call it my help. When you do ref, it goes, sweet, we're trying to grab this element and bring it to the view model and it's, we're gonna give it my L back in the view model. So we'll just instantiate it as null just so we can. And when attached is called, we now, like we now know that um, it's living in DOM, um, like all the DOM's actually been inserted into the, the rest of the DOM, I guess. Um, so this my L is now a thing and we can add an event listener onto it. <laughs> for a key press. And what we might do is just a basic like sweet little UX like improvement, which is uh, adding an event listener for when we say the 13, I think it's the return key. We'll find out. Um, so that when we press return in that box, it's gonna submit it. Um, so this is just demonstrating that we can get the element really, really easily into the view model without having to do any document to get on by ID or anything like that. Um, so, oh, uh, I think you put the ref in the wrong. Oh, I did too. We should just work like this normally, like have like a whole bunch of other developers, <laughs> just like every like every line you write. This is like taking extreme programming to another level. Um, so, so, yay. UX. <laughs> um, so then there's, in for components, so for the list, there's also um, lifecycle events. You can't prevent activation because it's a component being rendered. 
um, but you do get attached and you do get bound. So bound is when the data has been passed into the view model, but before it's actually created the template and like that. So if you need to modify anything on the go, you can have that as well. Um, the lifecycle events are really, really useful though, uh, especially you start building like big component-based systems. Um, and then saying that as well, building the big components-based stuff, if you've already used it, you'll know like preaching to the choir here really, but it is a really good way to go. It makes it a whole lot easier. Um, at some points, we're like uh, six components deep or something like that, and it's pretty easy to refactor just one in the middle without changing anything else in the other way. Um, sending events, there's many different ways to do it, but um, sending just native events onto the actual helm itself um, is really, really easy so that you can then um, say on the component itself, we can do a ref and get like our list. So ref list component something. And in the list component itself, you can actually, uh, if we import that inject on the Aurelia framework, yeah. you can inject the actual element itself. So you have this element. element. Uh, and now you can use that to so you can trigger events or like dispatch events on yourself that you can catch in later view models, something like that. So it's really easy and pretty easy to um, just build sort of decouple sort of applications in that sense. Um, yeah. So the element there you're saying is the HTML DOM element? That's yeah. Yeah. So it's the actual element. like, yeah, the DOM node sort of thing from JavaScript. It's not like a special like jQuery flavored okay. like node sort of thing, anything like that. Um, it's the actual thing, which is, it's nice. Um, it's just normal JavaScript. So uh, I don't know. Some people still might point out there's still some framework here, and that's definitely the case. Um, but when you're building an application like this, at least what we've built so far, it feels like all the stuff we're building is just JavaScript, and there's just a little bit of Aurelia just to wire things together where we need it and stuff. The main actual logic and lots of stuff is kind of just JavaScript still. It's really nice. Um, and ES6 is pretty easy and nice to write in. Yeah? Uh, one of the things that I like about Vue.js is when you use the view loader plugin, Not to keep them, is that in the same file? Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's for the same file. There's a um, there's an annotation and then I think there's a method as well you can call to just have an inline view. So like sometimes you just want to do a really, really tiny template and there's no point having an extra file for it um, for whatever reason you might think that. Um, there's an annotation for that, but I don't think you would really do anything like too big in a template sense there. Um, they're pretty big on keeping it separate. Um, they kind of feel that's good. It works for me. Okay, I think, are you talking about in the same folder or in the same file? Same physical file. Same physical file. Yeah. So you can have your template at the top, you can have your JavaScript in the middle, whatever all you want, you can have your SCSS or CSS at the bottom, and then it uses a web pack where we can build all of those things down into a single file for the entire application and the template is called plugins called view. Oh wait, is that, so the actual, your CSS, JavaScript, and HTML are all kept in separate files in, in your source code? Okay, so they're actually still in the same file, yeah. But it's separated by components, so for example, I have a list component here, um, maybe your thing that has a part of the list is separate components. Yeah. All the JavaScript and CSS and HTML for that component would be in one file. Yeah, and you yeah. Use the web one file that it's all going in between them. Yeah. So yeah, okay, so we, you can't do anything like that to keep JavaScript and HTML and um, the CSS in there, sort of in a similar sort of way, you can do it, but it's not really like done, I should say. Um, when you do things though, like in uh, the app.html, you'll see this here. Um, same thing as CSS and, and HTML, part of the Aurelia bundle, bundler is um, there's a plugin for, I think, uh, JSPM, uh, which is the plugin text and plugin CSS, I think, as well. And they can take then when you're like bundling up a code, uh, bundling up your sort of code base, they can take the CSS, put it into the JavaScript, and put your HTML templates into the JavaScript as well. Just so you package up and just as one JavaScript blob as you need it. So it's still a similar outcome, just the source files are, um, are split up for your different resources there. Um, but similar outcome though, still. Um, and that's usually like been mostly the biggest issue, I think, with working in this, especially starting out sort of fresh and new, is um, one, I had to learn JSPM and then had to learn the quirks about JSPM that are really people hated, um, and then how to get around that. So um, JSPM is an optional 
Sorry. It's not. It's optional. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I just chose the the like the option that had that. So they're working on moving to their own um, uh, package manager. That all from all I can tell so far is that they just want to use npm and GitHub and it just saves for everything else. Um, something really simple. There's a lot of breaking changes in the API for JSPM. They're getting really ticked off about, um, and it keeps breaking stuff basically for them. So yeah, um, that's probably the end of it. So any questions? Yes, cool. Is there an easy way to hook into the event chain? Like, let's say you want to do an auto complete with like debouncing and yep. um, sync to change kind of thing, like you can do yep. RFM out of the box. Does it provide access to those kinds of streams so it's easy to do, or is it pretty much pull in a bunch of other dependencies and do that? So, you have access to the elements, so you can add just native event listeners to any yep. of the elements, fine. Um, there's also a really good, um, it's called Aurelia Event Aggregator, which is a pub sub system that just sends things around and you listen and subscribe to different um, different sort of message names. Um, there's actually, I just put a package out last night for um, Mousetrap, if you've heard of that. It's like a keyboard shortcut library and all it does is dispatches Aurelia Event Aggregator uh, events, which means anywhere in the framework can sort of pick it up. Um, to answer the question sort of maybe specifically, like you can't just, uh, maybe? You have access to a lot of things in it. Yeah. Um, just how you wrote custom elements, so that's inserting your own HTML, like if this nav bar is a custom element per se, you can easily write custom attributes. Um, so that's what I actually use in that mousetrap one, so you can specify mousetrap um, click, and then it'll like find a keyboard shortcut to click on that element. So you can really easily do that. There's a lot of things that are open there. Um, and the event systems are pretty good. Um, I guess, we'll quickly just finish on the slide before we go into questions, I guess. Um, if you want to learn more about it, um, the Aurelia website's pretty good. Their docs have been pretty average, and they know this. Um, the best place is their Gitter channel, is like really, really active. Um, you'll speak directly with all the core contributors. It's For a couple of them, it's actually their day job, and they'll sit on there and answer questions, which is really great. The Durandal blog is like the official one from Durandal Inc. They'll talk about what they're, what's going on there. And if you're really interested in stuff, there's actually Dwayne Charrington. He's a really talented developer here as well, who I've actually sort of learned through uh, Aurelia. Um, he's a Brisbane based guy and he's reading, writing an ebook at the moment on LeanPub. So they publish out sort of what's been going on at the moment and um, you can give feedback and he better iterates on that. So it's like startup for ebooks basically. Um, he's got an ebook on writing out big applications um, everywhere from, I guess, building the really componentized stuff to just using a jQuery plugin within Aurelia. Um, just whatever you need sort of thing. Um, there's a decent Aurelia subreddit which is starting to get there. And there's a couple of good blogs as well. Like I find most of the documentation and the best examples of things come out from the either reading the source code because it's usually pretty tidy, or um, some of the blogs just around people who are really heavily invested in the community. Um, so Dwayne's got a blog. I like Kill Nerds. I don't understand the name behind it, but it's okay. And um, it's really good. There's lots of really good examples, um, and he's quite active in not only his own packages but on the main Aurelia chat room as well to get help. Um, but largely speaking, it's once you get your head over, sort of like head through the basic like binding and stuff like that, it works out to be pretty easy by the end. But yeah, do you have any questions about it? Yep. Yeah, so I'm, re I'm really interested in like uh, how much of this is actually going to get baked into like W3 specs and eventually become supported by browsers. Yeah, so there's been some stuff which I haven't completely understood, which is they're talking about support for web components, and I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I think they. I think it's that they currently support it, but that like you're not building components which are supposed to be the components. But there's a lot of stuff where they're they're just looking at what the sort of future spec is. Browsers are nowhere near implementing it, but they implement it in their framework such that you're building stuff that if you went to a different framework in like a couple years time, um, they'll probably be using it as well. So it's not so much like these are the exact attribute names annotations that you you would use for web components. It's more like so, this no. is the same kind of model. That yeah, 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 basically. So I don't think like things like value.bind and stuff, yeah, where decisions, they're not, as far as I'm aware, they're not value, uh, they're not um, web component specs or stuff. That's spec from the Aurelia binding sort of uh, sort of components. Um, they came out largely from like how do we bind stuff that in a logical way, and there's some good discussions about why they chose some um, and how it differs to um, some of the case sensitive binding you have in Angular 2, um, which is interesting. Yeah, uh, so it's not sort of fully 
um, like taking every aspect of like what work from homes might be, um, but it's pretty fun. A lot of other things. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Awesome. You should start talking. Hey everyone, uh, my name's Steve, and um, I'm just going to do a quick announcement on Angular Hack Day that we've got coming up this Saturday actually. So if you're interested in Angular 2, learning Angular 2, and joining up with a bunch of developers that are going to be hacking something out, I'm not sure what, um, in Angular 2, then we've got a website here, angularhackday.com, that you can sign up to. Um, so there'll be a bunch of people there acting as mentors as well to help you learn the ropes of Angular 2 if you've never, never done it before. Um, but we're also looking for a few people to be mentors there. So we've got, we've got a few at the moment, but if anyone's got experience with Angular 2 and want a free t-shirt and some pizza, um, come along to the Angular Hack Day on Saturday, just there. Um, sorry, this announcement was pushed on me last minute, so I'm a bit <laughs> underprepared. Um, yeah, so it's this Saturday, it starts at 9 a.m. and it'll be at the Microsoft building, um, which is sort of on the corner of George Street and Ann Street, I believe. Um, but it's not Microsoft affiliated anyway, it's just they had a room. Um, do to do, what else have we got? Yeah, so I was gonna start off with a few like 15 minute lightning talks on Angular 2, um, should get you up to speed. And then the rest of the day I'll just be um, making things with each other, which is cool. Uh, so if you can't make it to Camp JS, it's a nice alternative to Play around with some code with some people. Um, so yeah, it starts at nine. There's free pizza there, and you can sign up on angularhackday.com. Um, if you have any questions, just ask Brendan there or myself, and we'll maybe be able to answer them. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve. If you turn off my mic, I'll, I'll tweet there if you're off. Awesome. So yes, if you need any more details on the Angular Hack Day, uh, hit up these two gentlemen over here. Um, so while we're waiting on pizza, which shouldn't be too far away, they're about they were about fifteen minutes late. Um, I will crack open the S key and we can start our little networking session. Um, so if I close this and start this back up here. Um, come on. So, the next thing that's coming up after our intermission break will be Ash with his uh, ES6 modules talk. Um, otherwise, between that, I'll uh, give everyone a buzz at like 25 minutes or something when we can start back up again for that talk. Um, that's enough for me. So, uh, if you just want to uh, maybe move some of these chairs out of the, uh, out of the way on the side, well, we can all gather through there. Um, we've got plenty of drinks, there's soft drinks in there, there's uh, beers on the second layer, so you'll have to get your hand nice and cold to get to the second layer on the bottom. Um, so yeah, please everyone enjoy, dig in, chat amongst yourselves, get to know each other, get to know some Brisbane developers, it's all what it's about. Thank you. Hey man, thanks for coming.